Now that we know how to, uh, what a process is and how to create processes, let's see how we do interesting things with processes. We're going to be talking about this fork exec uh, model. And as we saw before, fork creates a copy of the current process, the process that called uh, fork. And exec v, what it's going to do is going to replace the current process code and address space with the code for a different program. Okay? In fact, there's a whole family of exec calls. I encourage you to explore them. Okay? So, uh, for example, here in this, in this code, we are calling fork. So if the PID is not zero, that's the parent. It created a child. Okay? And uh, otherwise, if the PID is zero, that's the child. Okay? And when we call exec v here, the child is going to replace its code and uh, its, its data and its address space with uh, the code and uh, address space from a different program. And this line here is going to be printed by the parent only. And we'll see. And that's, that's because exec v is not going to return. So let's, let's see an animation uh, of how this happens. Okay? So this, this is the parent process right here, parent process. Okay, so and uh, when you say that's 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 the bash um, process, right? The the shell that you type in your uh, that you might be running, probably running in your system. Okay, when you type ls, for example, what's going to do is bash is going to fork, right? Because it needs to create a, it needs to create a new process to execute the command ls. Okay, and here's how it's going to happen. So bash calls fork. Okay, so that's the parent, that's the original process here. And now it's going to create a child that at that point is exactly the same. These two are the same. Okay. But now what it needs to do, it needs to call exec and replace what was there in the child with the stack, the, the, the address space, and the code for the program ls. It's going to list the directory. Okay. So that's a high level view. Okay. So uh, the ba bash which is also process, happens to be a shell. When you type ls, it's going to create a new process, and it's going to replace the child process with uh, the code and address space for ls, because ls is, is just a program. Okay, okay. so now um, here's how exact v works in more detail. That's the prototype of the function. Okay, it receives three, three parameters. Okay, one is a file name. That's the file name of the executable. Uh, containing the program that we want to, to exec. These are the arguments that you're going to pass to, to, to the program. And this MVP is the environment, the, the list of environment variables. Things like, for example, the current directory and so on. Now note that exec v does not return. Why is that? Well, because it's going to be executing a different program now. And the exec v call was part of the original program that was uh, uh, it's part of the program that was running that, that was running before exact v. So as soon as you do exact v, that current program is no longer running. That's why it doesn't return. Unless there's an error, then it's going to return. Okay? And as I said before, it overrides the code, the data, and the stack. Okay? It keeps the, the process ID, open files, and a few other items. Okay? Now, um, let's see how this collection data structures here look like in memory. Okay, so that's the that's stack frame for main. Now we have what? We have the argument count, the uh, vector of arguments. Okay, that's why it points to a list of, uh, it points to a vector, and each entry in this vector is a pointer to the strings with the command line arguments. Okay? Now the environment NP points to a, uh, another vector that's a list of pointers to the contents of the environment variables. Okay, so it's a pretty beefy data structure. Okay? Um, all right, so this is how exact view works. Now, how do we end the process? We're going to use uh, a call called exit. And he receives a parameter, a status of why the process exit. Okay? So um, status code 0 is normally used for normal exits. And non-0 is a normal exit, like, you know, uh, there was an exception, or there was something. Something happened to the process. Okay. So, um, and if you if you want to register a function to be executed when you exit the process, you can you can call at exit because something's going to be executed at exit. For example, say that you call cleanup here, 
So if you say AT exit cleanup, when, when the process here exits, it's going to call this function cleanup here. Okay? So, but once this happens, it doesn't really completely destroy the process. It creates what we call a zombie, zombie process. Okay? So, um, and the reason we call it a zombie is because when a process terminates, it still consumes um, resources. Okay? So things like many tables in the OS that keep track of processes and so on. So we call it a zombie because it's kind of like a living corpse, half alive and half dead. But what happens if they build up? Well, uh, there's a process called reaping that cleans up after uh, a uh, dead process. And this is performed by the parent process on a terminated child. Okay, so when a parent process creates a child process and the child process exits, dies, uh, the, the parent is given its exit status information, uh, information and uh, with the, the reaping process tells the kernel to discard whatever was left from the process and recycle those, those resources. Okay? Now, what if a parent doesn't reap? Well, that, that could be a problem if the parent runs for a long time. But if any parent terminates without reaping, then uh, the, the child will be uh, reap, reaped by a need process, by the init process. And by the way, the init process is a process that is the parent of all processes in your system. Okay, when your operating system boots and it's ready to execute something, it creates this init process, which is sort of like the canonical process uh, from which all other processes derive. Okay? So, and if a parent terminates without reaping a child, then the child will be reaped by the init process. Okay? But one thing to note is that if you have a long running process, you need to do explicit reaping, otherwise uh, nobody's going to reap it, it's going to be using resources, eventually it's going to exhaust its resources. And examples of long-lived processes that need to do reaping are things like shells and servers and so on. Okay? All right. So now that we know what happens when a process dies, let's see how we use that uh, for synchronization. There's this function called wait that's used to synchronize with children processes. Okay? So what it does is, when you call wait, it suspends the current process, for example, the parent, until one of its uh, children terminates, okay? And the return value is the PID of the child process that terminated because a parent could have multiple child that it's waiting to die on. And um, on successful return, the, the child process is then uh, reaped, okay? And by the way, if the child status is set to not, this is a parameter to, to the wait function, if it's set to not null, then the, the integer that it points to, because notice that it's an integer pointer, the thing that it points to will be set to a status indicating why the child process terminated. Okay? So, uh, because now we can read the, stat the exit status of the process. This int return here just returns the PID. That's the PID. Okay? And this points to the status uh, at exit that the child had. Okay? So, and there are, uh, there are special macros for uh, this, to interpret this status, and you can see wait to, you can do man, wait to, and, and see what those mean. So now note that if a parent process multiple children, if you call wait, it will return the, uh, when any of the children terminates. That's why there's another call called wait PID. And what it does, you can, pa you can wait on a specific child process by passing its, its uh, PID as a parameter. Okay, so let's see an example of wait here. So we have this function here called uh, fork wait. It forks here. If it's zero, again, it's the child. It says hello from child. Otherwise, um, that's the parent. That's, uh, and it's going to do the following. It's going to do child PID. It's going to do wait on the child, on and child status, just an integer here. Okay, and when, when that returns, it's because the child has died. So now, when, when that happens, it's going to print the PID of the child. Note that this returned by wait, okay? And uh, it's going to say it has terminated, okay? And then it's going to say uh, bye. So let's see how, how this uh, works here. Um, here you have originally the process was running, then it forks, okay? Then eventually uh, the child is going to say bye. Whenever the child says bye, it's because it has returned, therefore we come back here, and then the parent calls by. Pretty interesting, right? Super 
simple and in fact you can imagine very complicated trees and arrangements of how of how uh, parents and child uh, synchronize. So to, to summarize, uh, recall that fork gets two copies of the same process, okay? But it but fork returns different values to the two process. And fork is a special function you call once, but we return twice because that's the point where it replicates the process. Okay? So exact V um, has a new process replaces itself with one with the one that called it. Okay? So it's a two process uh, program. Okay? So when you uh, you call fork, so here's an example of a two process program. You first call fork, and if the PID is zero, that's the child code. Otherwise, exit the, the the parent code, and that's where you'd use, uh, and, and in the child code, that's where you call exactly to replace itself with a new program, okay? So now, at that point, you have two completely, um, two completely different programs, okay? Great. So, and wait, and wait PID is used to synchronize uh, parent and child execution, and whenever you do the synchronization process, uh, the child, like the, the remains of the child process is collected when it, uh, it exits, okay? So, um, in the final summary of this, this section, we now ending our uh, section on processes. So the thing to keep in mind is that at any given time, the system has a lot of active processes. In fact, if you type in Linux, ps, for example, minus ef to, 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 make, it, to make it return here, to make it easy to, to read, when you type that, you're gonna see the list of all processes running. Okay, so that's, that's your prompt here. You type PS minus F, you're going to get a list. Okay. But if you have a single CPU, only one can execute at a time. And the process has the illusion that it has full control of the CPU. That's pretty cool, right? It, it's a really important abstraction. Right? Okay? And from time to time, uh, DOS has to do the context switch because if there's a single CPU, you want to give the illusion that things are running at the same time. So it keeps bouncing back and forth between between uh, the, the running processes, okay? So, and uh, we do process management with this fork exact model that you just learned. That's conclusive section, see you soon.